Welcome to IREB Resistance Radio, where we discuss the resistance work going on in Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District. IREB is an indivisible group formed after the 2016 election in opposition to an executive that we feared was going to do grave damage to our country. As our fears have been proven out, so has our membership grown. We attract people from across the political spectrum, but make no mistake, we are united as a progressive force in Minnesota's politics. Join us on our Facebook page, search for The Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. All right, welcome to our next podcast, and today's guest is a very special guest indeed, Julie Blaha. She's uh, come and visited, or she's visited us in IREB before, uh, had uh, spoke before our, our meeting. Um, we're so glad to have her back. She's running uh, for uh, auditor, and uh, I, I welcome, Julie. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much. I've, uh, you know, I've been following you, and, and honestly, I just want to say a couple of nice things, and I didn't tell you about this beforehand, is, uh, you know, whenever Julie's in a room, and, and so I want to add this kind of personal touch to whoever's watching this, whenever Julie's in a room, it's like your favorite aunt walked into a room. I mean, that is what she feels like. She is, she is every, has every ounce of energy that she seems to have, and it's genuine, and, you, and, and when you're in a room with her, you just can't help but, but notice it. Well, anyway, so Julie, what I want to do is I just want to give you a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, um, some folks might not know you. One of the things about our group, IREB, is that, you know, we take people who are, you know, uh, don't know anything about the political process. And so we answer questions, you know, for folks that, that are just beginning. And, and so, you know, kind of when, when, you're, when you're thinking about our, our crowd, you know, our folks, you know, they, you know there isn't any, any detail that, that they don't like listening to. So tell us a little bit about yourself. And then a little bit, uh, another thing that's a little sp uh, specific to IREB is we like to ask people what got them involved in politics. What was that thing that made you stand up and get involved, if you, if you wouldn't mind? Sure. Uh, yeah, again, my name is Julie Blaha, and I'm in one of those great down ballot races uh, that sometimes have trouble cutting through. One thing I love about IREB is that you all are willing to go in the weeds and really get it. <laughs> uh, and since again, I'm down ballot, I'm sitting behind a giant, in front of a giant sign with my name on it because it's my job to get my name out right now. Uh, so uh, I started out as a, I was a math, middle school math teacher. Uh, did that for a dozen years. Uh, I've also been president of my local teachers union. Uh, most recently, I was the treasurer of the Minnesota AFL-CIO. That's a union of unions that represents uh, over 300,000 working Minnesotans. Uh, and, you know, through that process, when you work with uh, schools, when you work with working people, you start to realize how important local government is. You know, I think a lot of us start out and uh, you're, you're, the, the, the federal and the national stuff is really the grabber. That gets your attention. But the longer you're involved, I, I think the more uh, important you see that local government level be. You know, if they want to get things kind of jammed up in uh, Washington, D.C. or in St. Paul, you know, we can fix things in our communities. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that when people want to make advancements on uh, pay equity or on um, improving pay for low wage workers, they're doing it at the city level. People want to look at health care issues like extending health care benefits to low wage workers. They're doing it town by town. So there's something really great about local government. And this is the office, the state auditor's office, is the one that can really leverage statewide power to the local level. Basically, uh, Minnesota State Auditor does uh, three things. Uh, she'll work on uh, oversight, education, and representation. First off, it's oversight of over $20 billion spent at the local level in cities, towns, counties, school districts, uh, you know, uh, economic development authorities, uh, water conservation districts, this very basic foundational level of government. Uh, second, she works with education. So if you get elected to, uh, to city council, maybe you're a county commissioner, we can help you understand your budget so that you can make good decisions. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, our auditor serves on six major boards and uh, works in lots of other areas to provide representation for Minnesotans on financial issues, specifically things like pension boards, uh, economic development authorities, uh, housing boards, and uh, the biggest one is the Minnesota Board of Investment, where we invest um, over $95 billion uh, in, uh, in, in investments uh, around the world that help support our state, particularly our pensions. And uh, so basically, it, probably the most important thing about the auditor is our auditor is an arbiter of truth. And in these times, when truth is under, uh, under some attack, we need an auditor that can focus on the truth. 
Um, and then you were mentioning about how I got in, uh, asked how I got into politics. Uh, you know, it's interesting. My very first job with a paycheck, an actual paycheck I could hold, was calling people, asking them who they were going to vote for when I was 14. Now, it seemed like a position of glamour because it was at night. Uh, it was <laughs> Again, a real paycheck. And so I got to ask people at dinner <laughs> and interrupt them and say, hi, if the election were held today, would you vote for A, the Democrat? Mike Dukakis I just worked on that ballot. And it just seemed really exciting to me. So I, I think one of the best things about starting with arguably one of the least favorite jobs in politics is that it's all up from there. Uh, and so from there, uh, I, I started working again, in local politics. Uh, I managed a couple campaigns, worked on school levies, but it really got big when I became a teacher and I realized that every single decision in my classroom went through a political process. Every pencil we bought, every uh, book we chose, they all went through either a school board or a legislature or the federal government. And I realized just how important it was to truly serve my students completely. Uh, it was really important for me to in be involved in, uh, in local government as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. Politics is in every aspect of our lives. And, you know, the, the, um, the thing that we hear, you know, play company doesn't talk about, you know, I don't agree with that. I, I think, you know, uh, smart people can discuss politics in a way that, that doesn't lead to, you know, difficulties and, and we need to be better at it. All right. Well, I think that's something that yeah, the auditor can do uh, a lot for as well, because, you know, I think a lot of people when they first get engaged in politics, there's this feeling that, oh, I can't understand this, particularly when it comes to financial matters. I see people go to city council meetings and think, oh, I, I could never, I could never set this budget or go to a school board meeting and say, well, I can never tell if, if the money that we got off of our levy is going where I expected. And you know what? You absolutely can understand this stuff. Uh, and that's what a good art does. Make sure that regular people like you and me have real access to the data and analysis to make good decisions. Literally, everybody watching this podcast can absolutely make a billion dollar budget decision. You absolutely have the skills to do it. Uh, you might have to need a couple more tools, but you need an auditor that truly believes you can do it. Uh, and I think that's a big difference between me uh, and my opponent. I know that regular people can solve their problems and I'm ready to give them the information and let them go. Well, I, I like the sound of that. So um, let's let's get back to you being a math teacher. Let's talk a little bit about that. And then, and why did how did that help you prepare for this job as auditor? Well, you know, one of the, the as I was deciding my math career, uh, you know, I could have taught calculus. I could have. Uh, I was looking at one point at being a theoretical physicist, uh, and you know, all that big, very esoteric and very very abstract stuff was really exciting to me. But uh, then when I got to help a student. Uh, with, uh, I think it was learning subtraction, which if you're a teacher, you understand that subtraction is a really, it can be a challenging thing to teach. It's difficult for human brain to understand for the first time. And what I realized that that was the most exciting part of teaching, being where students first start to understand how they use math in a way that solves problems in a deep way. Uh, that was really exciting. That's why I chose middle school math instead of say high school math or, or uh, going into research. Uh, because that, that, that moment of really understanding is terrific. And that was one of the reasons I chose to run for auditor, too, is the state auditor gets to work with a lot of people in their very first elected position, you know, in the local government. And that is so exciting. That's a place where people have a lot of passion. They have some great creativity. And all they need are the tools to make it real. And, and you see that time when somebody, just like when a student first learns how to use a mathematical tool to to make something, an idea become real. Seeing a new elected official get their very first policy enacted and then see how it affects their neighbors, that's really special. That's just magical. And I wanna be part of that. I wanna be part of that place where this moment that got you involved in politics makes you successful so that that moment can really become a movement. Uh, I, I would say auditor, best position to run for. <laughs> Sounds like a good fit. Well, what about um, about your leadership? Now you have like issues like LGBTQ bullying and and then the historic pension bill. Um, why why do those things make you the best choice for auditor? Well, yeah, we, I think one of the things the challenges in when you're choosing an auditor uh, is that people hear the term auditor and uh, sometimes they first think of all the technical aspects of it. Um, 
you know, but, but you're choosing a leader in very much the same way. You're choosing a leader when you choose a governor. You're choosing a leader when you're choosing the attorney general. You're choosing a leader when you choose secretary of state. You need to look at the person's leadership ability to choose an auditor. You're not, you're not picking an accountant to do your taxes. You are choosing somebody to guide an office and be a bridge between regular Minnesotans and complicated financial information. And, and so my background has been in some nice, um, really thorny, uh, leadership opportunities. I, I kind of think that's where all the, the real creativity is. Uh, in Anoka Hennepin, when I was union president, uh, our, our school district faced the largest LGBTQ bullying pr crisis uh, we'd ever faced. We were seeing suicides. We we're seeing a lot of pain, a, a, a lot of real trauma among our LGBTQ students. Uh, to the point that it um, uh, caused the uh, largest uh, LGBTQ bullying lawsuit in U.S. history in a school. And, and when we were in there, uh, we had this opportunity. We, we knew that it was a really tense situation. It was in Michelle Bachman's, if you know that congresswoman, former congresswoman, Michelle Bachman's district. Uh, so there's some very strong opinions. Uh, our job was, though, we, we had to help our students. We didn't have the luxury of a fight. We had kids that needed us right now. So as educators, we came together in a way that I don't think I saw, uh, I really don't think we had a chance to do anywhere else. We were able to come together in a room with very conservative teachers and very liberal teachers, teachers who were deeply concerned about LGBTQ people and LGBTQ teachers themselves. We came together in the same room. And because we had a couple of things, we had success. Uh, one, we loved our kids. That was the most important. We loved our kids. Uh, second, we had a connection to each other. We were in the same union. Uh, but third, we also had a good piece of research. We had a set of, of um, really well-researched practices that we knew helped kids be successful in school and feel safe while they're there. When we were able to start from that one true place, we were able to come to some conclusions. We were arguably the only place where people from across ideological spectra actually came up with solutions, many of which found their way into the Safe Schools Bill that I believe helped um, improve safety in schools uh, statewide uh, and even went out to other parts of the country as well. And, and so when you start with something true, sometimes even in the toughest situations, you can, you can start to find solutions. I also worked as a labor leader. I worked on the Blue Green Alliance, which is one of the only places you may find people who work in the mines in the same room as the Sierra Club <laughs> and actually <laughs> finding some common ground and finding some ways that can actually work together. Uh, on the last pension bill, pensions uh, can get to be a, a sticky issue. Uh, you know, there's a big fight between whether or not we should continue to have the defined benefit pensions that we have promised people who've earned them, or if we should switch over to a defined contribution program. It's an inherently riskier situation, but it can save money. Uh, and so we were able to bring people together from, again, across uh, ideology on that, from people who'd like to see pensions gone entirely, to each people who know how important they are, who depend on them themselves, and know that the whole community depends on them. Well, in this last uh, legislative session, we were able to come together with an historic uh, stabilization of those funds. Uh, it really, it took, it took years, it was years in the making, it was everybody giving a little bit, some really difficult, challenging discussions, people taking big risks, crossing party lines in a real and risky way. And because we're all willing to do that, take real risks, and because we could share with people exactly the impact of pensions in Minnesota, we're talking billions of dollars that lift entire communities. People know exactly how much money we were talking about and exactly where it was, particularly that it's um, that uh, there, a majority of the money is in greater Minnesota. Uh, people wanted to come together in a way they couldn't in years. Uh, that's, that's what a good auditor can do. It's, you're going to start and say, hey, I'll, I'll tell you what, no matter what we all believe to start, here's something true we can begin with. Here's a place to, to look, a place we can agree, and a springboard to something, uh, to something more. Pro probably, I think my favorite use of data, though, was uh, when I'd be bargaining uh, contracts with, for teachers. Uh, we had arguably our best round of teacher contract bargaining when Everybody came together at the beginning with the audit. We had quality time with the audit. We, it was the, uh, the, the bargaining team from the teachers. It was the school board. It was financial people from the district office, from the state. We grabbed the audit. We sat down, dug into it, and came to agreement on where the money was and where it wasn't. And I'll tell you, when we started there, even before we started bargaining, 
it was, oh my gosh, it was, it was five times easier uh, than any other round because we didn't have to fight about the facts. We, we had the facts to start with and then we could talk about ideas. Then you can move to solutions. Uh, and so I know that there's great power in numbers and I really want to bring that to people so they can have the same success uh, I was able to have in these situations. Well, you know, the thing, a couple of things I, I also love about you is, you know, your connection to unions. You know, there's um, lately I've been seeing some of our, the opponents, um, you know, getting some of these these kind of one off union endorsements are trying to make it look like, you know, the other party is the party of unions. And it's not, uh, you know, our and, and I love that how how connected to union work you are. I, I'm a longtime union advocate myself. Um, the other thing, um, what was it that you said uh, uh you, about loving data, I, I you just uh, you're, you're describing. I I thought I'd never heard hear that in a sentence from anyone. But you know the one thing I love about Democrats too, and you know I, I actually had Jim Carlson on here not too long ago, and and you know you guys are just enough of nerds to to like that kind of stuff and be good at it. But you know you're actually got a great personality to go with it. So it's a it's a great balance, I think. You know I. I progressive. I, I have a joke that doesn't always work, uh, and I'll start out saying, hey. You know, I'm so glad you're here. This is the position of glitz and glamour you've been waiting for. Don't worry, I've got plenty of spreadsheets and I think I'm gonna get a laugh, but then there's always about half the room that says, oh, we, we thought you were serious about the spreadsheets. And they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna talk about something else. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of people wanna get into the numbers, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people just need the confidence and somebody that truly understands that they can understand this. You know, and if, if you're confused about numbers and government, you know, that's, that's not you, uh, that's us. That's our job to make sure that we're communicating clearly. So if you go into a board meeting, if you go to uh, talk to a legislator, or you're talking to any local leader, and if you feel like, wow, I don't, I don't get this, maybe I'm not smart enough to understand it, that's not you. You know, it's our job to make sure that numbers and information are accessible to everybody who can be part of that decision. So again, it's on us, not you. It's one thing you learn as a teacher. Um, there's a temptation after your first tough lesson as a, as, as a, when you're starting out to say, ah, it's not my fault, I taught it. Well, every good teacher knows it doesn't matter if you taught it, what matters is if your students learned it. And it's the same way in government. If you're struggling to understand something, no, that's on me. My job is to make sure that you understand what's, uh, you know, what you're dealing with. And if you don't understand it, I've got work to do. I have an opportunity to, uh, to improve things. So if you don't understand it, you stay in. And I promise you, if you are at, if you're at a board meeting and you ask a numbers question, uh, just quick look around the room and see how many other people lean in because they were, they were too embarrassed to ask them that. Yeah. I promise you, if you have a question about the numbers, you are never, well, you should never say never, but I can almost, I'm going to say it. You're never the only one who had that question. <laughs> Somebody else had that same question and is so glad you asked it. And you know what? You deserve a good answer. You deserve an answer you understand. And you stay in there until you get it. I, I like that. I like that answer. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's put you on the spot a little bit. So your opponent, uh, your opponent says that uh, she's an auditor. Um, what do you got to say about that? Well, you know, again, it's 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 a good it's a good experience for the job. I'll give I'll give her that. Uh, you know, she was uh, she spent six years in auditing in the eighties, uh, and uh, she kept her license up, up off and on. You know, during that time, good idea. You know, not not a bad choice. Uh, but uh, but again, uh, while that I think is helpful, just in the same way. Um, being a math teacher is helpful, or for me, being a treasurer of a multi-million dollar organization uh, was helpful. Uh, none of it is enough. Being an auditor is not enough. Being a math teacher is not enough. Being a um, treasurer isn't enough. Uh, it's about leadership. And, and when you look at this job, you have to look at what direction you're gonna take, uh, you're gonna take the department. Are you gonna be focused on the people who use the data? Uh, are you gonna be focused on trying to catch Kind of a gotcha approach um, to people working hard in local government is a really different approach um, and when i see how she talks about the position it seems that what she's done is she's dug through statutes on her own picked out things she thought was important and is putting that out there and wants to uh basically go out and get some rubber stamps on that well that's not leadership you know a good leader goes out to the people who have to uh who rely on the office who use the systems and the data every day and ask them what they need it's not about what I think has to come first. It's about what the uh, township clerks think has to come first. It's what your county auditor needs right now. 
And, and so uh, instead of that kind of top-down approach, I have a bottom-up approach. I'm going to go out and talk to people first. Um, and I want to come up with our plans together and genuinely together, not coming out, already having it all planned out in my head and just hoping that you'll agree, but genuinely being ready to move with what people need in that moment. Uh, that's a big difference between the two of us. So again, you're not picking the company, you're choosing a leader. And you need to look at which one of us has the leadership ability to handle uh, these these potentially divisive times. I, I agree with that. Well, yeah. let's let, let's stay with this this uh, this opponent theme. One more question: um, you, your your campaign recently asked them to take some dangerous links down. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I think this is was really telling. Um, you know, uh, we had seen uh, we saw a a letter to the editor. Uh, and I saw it in the, you know, I live up in Anoka. I saw this in the, in, in the Blaine paper. And it made this, um, uh, it, it retold a rumor uh, that was out there. You may have remembered this back in May. Uh, there was genuinely some issues around fraud in daycare centers uh, that received federal funds uh, and state funds. So this was, uh, it was a real issue. It was an issue that deserved investigation. They were catching problems and working on fixing those. Uh, but then in that process, because some of these daycare centers um, were um, started by Somali immigrants, there were people who were saying, oh, this is a way for Somalis to funnel money um, overseas to terrorists. I mean, a really, an absolutely uncorroborated, um, you know, unsubstantiated rumor that was put out there. Uh, in fact, when the person who made the rumor originally was testifying on it, he said, I refuse to take any questions. He just put the rumors out there. It would not take questions from the legislative committee to testify to. And, you know, they have never found any links to show that, that that to be true. Now, okay, we saw this in a letter, and it was on her, the person had, had, had said this, um, repeated this rumor in a letter on her behalf. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Then we saw that she put it on her website. And then we saw she put another one on the website that, um, that all that said it again that there was money funneled overseas to terrorists and we and this was right at about the same time that all of a sudden um, we see bombs being delivered around the country and then we saw what happened uh, at the synagogue and, and, and when, when we saw this like we have to talk about this and so we sent her a note uh, we mentioned on Twitter and said hey you've got to take these links to these down this is not only is this information inaccurate uh, it is also dangerous. This is irresponsible to be throwing rumors out like this about our immigrant neighbors and particularly at a, uh, about places that care for children. And so we asked her to take them down. Uh, her response was um, uh, that, uh, I think, uh, to the, something to the effect of, I won't, be, I, I, I won't let Minnesotans be bullied um, when they get something from a good news source. A and it was really ironic because uh, the quickest Google search will show that the original story was pretty, pretty, pretty well debunked and, and shown to have been poorly researched, uh, badly sourced, uh, and, and really, uh, really uncorroborated. And so we said, hey, all we're saying is we just want you to take your links down. You know, you shouldn't link to this because, you know, you need to be in a position where not only will you give out accurate data, but you can be responsible with it you know the consequences of what you say and and for someone trying to run for auditor to be that that cavalier about putting out a piece of information that could be dangerous in this climate I, I, that's just that is a good auditor needs to be accurate and responsible in this case she was neither and, and this is something that goes beyond politics this goes beyond uh, even this election, this is just something we cannot do. We have to be careful when we talk about our neighbors, especially neighbors that already face hate and discrimination every day. We cannot be irresponsible with rumors surrounding them. And, and uh, to this date, she still, uh, she still has the links up on her, her website, as far as we can tell, uh, and uh, has no intention of, of disavowing uh, these rumors. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for standing up for that. That, that that's, uh, 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 Thank you. Well, all right. So we've reached the end of the show or the end of the podcast. I want to give you a couple of minutes to close us out. Why do you want to, people to vote for Julie Blaha? Well, I think I, I don't just want you to vote for me. I want to make sure you vote all the way down your ballot and then flip it over and vote on the back. Uh, one thing, running down the ballot, you really learn uh, how tough it is to cut through a big dramatic uh, election cycle. But um, how much 
how important it is. These down ballot races, we deal with the things that affect you every day. We deal with the things that literally get you out of the driveway when it snows, that get your kids to school and back safely. These are important races. Uh, you know what? Go online, do a little bit of research, uh, write yourself up a list. You can take that list into the ballot box uh, and, and, and take a look at the whole, uh, everybody down the ballot. Uh, I, I think that right now we need somebody who is dedicated to the truth, uh, both at being accurate and responsible. I'm willing to be there for you on that. So I'd be honored to have your vote. But I'd also urge you to, again, after you fill out your favorite uh, circles, keep going and vote that whole ballot. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the show. And, and I'm looking forward to talking to you again real soon. Oh, this is so exciting. I love all, everything you're doing. Stay in there. We're going to have a good election day. I hope so. I just hope so. All right. Take care, Julie. Thank you.